Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton with Supply Chain Now will here with you. Welcome to today's episode. So today, we're talking with one of our all-time faves, right? A fellow veteran supply chain practitioner that I promise you, he's going to inform, inspire, and entertain you with his perspective, expertise, and point of view. So especially on all things leadership, which is, of course, one of our favorite topics here at Supply Chain Now. So with no further ado, I want to welcome in our guest today, Charles Walker, Logistics Business Development Manager with the Ginn Group. Charles, how you doing? I'm doing great. Scott, how you doing? Great I'm doing wonderful. You. Great to see you again, man, always. You as well. It's been too long. I, I think the last time you were with us, it was with a, a, on a live stream. We had you and Greg and Crystal, and I think we were talking about things that bad leaders did. Do you remember that episode? Absolutely. 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 <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Well, we'll see if we can't put the link to that one uh, in the episode notes of today's. But great to see you back. Um, first off, how are things going? Have you had a great year? Oh, absolutely. Man, I wake up, I'm good to go. Um, I just go day by day, man. I'll try to get ahead. I just pray about it and then uh, keep it out more spirit and keep it moving, man. Uh, you wake up, you should be able to get up and do what you got to do. That's just mm. it. I'm glad you mentioned that because we're going to be talking about your time uh, in Airborne with the U.S. Army. So, uh, a listener, stay tuned for that. But I want to start with, it's been a little while since you've been with us. And one of my favorite elements, you know, we've interviewed you on our Veteran Voices. We've interviewed you a couple of times on Supply Chain, you know, our, our mothership here. Um, I want to give folk, one of my favorite aspects of all of those conversations is talking about kind of your roots and, and and where you grew up and some of those key lessons learned and some of the food that you and oh, I yeah. both love too much probably. So tell us, where did you grow up? Because you grew up in a big family in Alabama, right? Right, right. I grew up in a, in a, a family of 13, man, seven boys and six girls in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, you know, a lot of people are familiar with Birmingham and, and the civil rights movement and all these things that my, my parents and grandparents went through. So they did a lot to, to raise us with uh, proper respect for others and discipline, man. So I appreciate my family for that. Uh, most of my siblings are still there. I uh, lost a couple, but uh, everything is good. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, man. Actually, I went to elementary school there and okay. graduated from Parker High School, A.H. Parker High School, a very prominent high school there uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. So does that make you, I think we talked about this last time, um, I know this is a very contentious issue for folks in Alabama. Are you an Auburn fan or are you a Bama fan? Well, you know, uh, it's, it's a split. You're going to be either or, but I'm a Bama fan all the okay. way, man. So, so I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Bama all the Well, day. Nick Saban, I don't think he can fit any more trophies into that massive trophy case. I mean, he is, uh, talk about a generational uh, Hall of Fame coach and team. Y'all been rolling. Um, yeah. Okay. So growing up in Birmingham, Alabama, gosh, a family of 13, I can only imagine the meals y'all had together and how much fun that had to have been growing up. Um, let's talk about food for a second, because last time you were with us, I think we were talking about uh, barbecue, one of our mutual favorite uh, dishes. What's one food dish that's inseparable from your childhood growing up? Actually, we did. We talked about a barbecue in a place called uh, Old Plantation Barbecue. In Birmingham, it was a very known place there. Uh, but my main foods is like uh, just southern cooking, um, uh, Scott. Uh, in the South, you know, you, you most of the things are fried and fried chicken, pork chops. And my mom, she mm. she she made a meal out of whatever we had. Uh, Sometimes we she'll go to the vegetable garden and get things. And she taught us early on how it's always something to eat in the house. You just gotta find it and create mm. it. And so she was a creative person with that many kids. She had to. Or do what she had to do. So I'm very appreciative of her and how she raised us with the discipline, uh, some values that she said, you got to graduate to be in my house and then you have to make some out of your life. So I think that stuck with me as a kid and I just developed it as I got older, you know, and food was one of the main things, uh, uh, breakfast, oatmeal, early in the morning, 
You know, you got oatmeal, you know, so a lot of people like Man, oatmeal. I'm like, yeah, you had that almost every day. Because it was cheap and it could feed a lot of people. Right. Well, that's what I was thinking. I, man, I couldn't, you know, we've got three kids here and and with me and my uh, my uh, better half, Amanda Luton, right? And, yeah. And gosh, I think I have a hard time making ends meet at times. I couldn't imagine having a, a, a household with 13 uh, kids. So I'm sure... It was a regular, uh, a regular part of uh, daily focus. How to how to um, uh, make things go further, right? Especially food. That's right. And, you know, you got to look at the, the times. You know, right now we have evolved from a lot of the times with technology and things like that, uh, and just the way people think. But back then, uh, they had large families. Then had to embrace the struggle. You know, like it wasn't a struggle to them. It was just a way of life. You know, I got to feed my kids. I got to ensure they get the things they need. So they won't have to live the life that I live. So a lot of times we, and I look at my mom and grandma now, they they, they put a lot of time in so saying, hey, I'm going to give my kids the things that I didn't have. Right. But they was really giving the things they did have, like self-respect, discipline, and things of that nature that we need to live a long life. Mm-hmm. And then we get all those things. We, we reflect on it when we get older. We say, hey, mom yeah. gave me more than food. She gave me... The, the values of life that I can keep living and keep going. Man, I love that. Strong, uh, strong upbringing that, uh, filled with values and core values that clearly has stayed with you uh, and maybe impact your daily behavior now and, and put you in position to pass those on is what I'm, some of the things I'm hearing. Um, so let's shift gears here. So, because we could talk about probably Southern cuisine for hours on end. I bet you and I could compare a lot of different recipes and favorites. Absolutely. But let's shift gears. We're going to touch on your time, uh, again, in the U.S. Army Airborne, and then we're going to touch on um, uh, both supply chain lessons learned from that time and leadership, uh, your leadership advice for these uncertain times. So what, backing up, what made you want to join not only the Army, but what also prompted you to want to leap out of planes? You know, it's strange how it happens. You know, like sometimes our life just unfolds for us. Initially, I left home. Uh, my mom was very proud. The first one in the family to to go off to college. I went off on the Pell Grant back then. It was the Pell Grant uh, for uh, lower economic families to go to to HBCU school. I went to Talladega College initially, and uh, after a certain period of time being there, I think maybe my junior sophomore junior year, the Pell Grant actually ran out, and then I was like. Knowing that my mom had put it, we got to do something productive in life, I, I decided to listen to the, um, the military. Um, mm-hmm. And when I scored on the uh, on the ASVAB, what came up was a lot of, you know, infantry, all that comes up, but it was uh, equipment records and parts specialists, which so was really like, quick. So, Charles, really quick for our listeners, when you say ASVAB, if I, if I can remember that correctly as a fellow veteran, that it's going to be your armed services Vocational Assessment Battery, I believe is what that stands for. And listeners, basically what that is, what he's talking about taking that test, is every um, entrant into the armed services, they give you this test to figure out where what skill sets you have and where you might be presenting the most value to the military. And, uh, and that really uh, has a big impact on what you end up doing in the military. So is that right, Charles? Absolutely right. And uh, you know, you, 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 you do a test uh, evaluation of which uh, military occupational specialty come up, the MOS, they'll place and say, well, which one of these you want to pick or whatever. And when the guy explained to me about supply chain, uh, supply sergeant logistics, uh, accounting for all the property that the commander has in the unit, that just resonated with me because I always wanted to uh, know and be accountable for everything that appears. You know, I, I wonder how parts come to your house or how somebody delivers something and you get what you, you ask for. And I wanted to be a part of that. It was just, Innate, my innate spirit, I think it was. Yeah. So I so, think that. Okay. All right. So tell us about um, um, some of the things you did as part of U.S. Army Airborne, because I bet it, not many of our listeners are going to be able to relate. I mean, you're you're one of a very special few. Oh, yeah. And, and actually, I, I stumbled into uh, airborne operations. You know, as a child, I was afraid of heights. And uh, when I was, uh, when I went through basic training at the, uh, up in Missouri, or Fort Leonardwood, Missouri, uh, one of the drill sergeants was talking to us about um, the airborne needed more supply chain professionals to 
to go airborne. And the fear immediately came over me. I'm like, dude, I'm scared to go to Six Flags, you know? Uh, <laughs> and everybody in my family was like, so I raised my hand, and me and my buddy, battle buddy, we said, man, we're going to go. I'm like, uh, I raised my hand, and they moved us. When we left AIT in the, uh, Fort Lee uh, at the training, they sent us right down to 37th Range Battalion. Uh, and he's like, yeah, you guys are going to be our new logistic teams, but you got to go airborne. And I'm like, uh, the fear, fear set in immediately, you know, but uh, they did they did a special thing with us to get us over the fear. Uh, it's like a, a psychological test where you go out and watch everybody coming from the airplanes and everything like that, jumping out, and then you, you watch the planes land. And, and I just got excited about that. And then I said, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go airborne. You know, man. they're going to set you apart from everybody else, man, in the logistic field. So that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be on with the elite guys, you know, because I saw them. I went down and seen the guy at the range battalion. I was like, yeah, I want to be like those guys right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I love that. Um, and I can only imagine. Um, uh, so, you know, arguably, or maybe inarguably, I don't know, the military invented logistics, right? They basically invented supply chain management in many ways. Um, and there's some interesting um uh, historical writings on kind of where all that originated going way back in ancient times. Um, so clearly with when they basically invited you to join Airborne, you and your battle buddy, as you put it, um, that value that the military puts on logistics expertise and supply chain expertise is uh, evident once more. What, why did, why, um, did they identify any specific needs of what they needed in Airborne, uh, you know, that you brought to the table? Yes, yes, they did. They identified that uh, uh, they wanted the uh, logistics uh, operational teams to be to be airborne and be able to get the supplies and equipment uh, wherever the guys needed and soft. And the special operations forces, they needed guys that could do some of the same things that the special operations forces could do with the same mentality, but be there on right on time and place where they needed it at. So they needed you to have specialty skills outside of just your MOS. They wanted you to be able to, hey, if we need you to jump in and set up a tactical operations center or have those supplies and equipment on hand, you had to be able to do those things as a logistics team. And so I thought that was special, and that and we got the recognition for that as well. Man, that is awesome, uh, bringing logistics and supply chain know-how literally to the to the front lines and, and – um, you know, boots on ground right there, knowing all the conditions, not guessing it at a command center somewhere. I can only imagine the efficiency and the gains overall and the immense value that that has to you know, have you and, and your fellow logistics pros right there with the, the special ops teams and, and the rest of the airborne units. Exactly. And you got to look at it. If a guy can jump out a perfectly good airplane, a lot of his fear is going to be out the way when he got to have supplies and equipment in place uh, because he's already show that he can conquer fear uh, because if, if you can jump out of an airplane and trust your equipment and trust your, your battle buddies, uh, of course you can get the equipment in the place where it needs to be at all times. So yep. that's special. All right. So moving more directly into that supply chain conversation, now that you know, you've been in supply chain since you separated uh, from the Army um, for years now, what, what's, uh, if you were to think of a short list of things that the Army – really instilled in you, uh, especially like supply chain lessons that you've applied since uh, in your career as a practitioner, what are some things that come to your mind, Charles? I, I really, man, I really think, Scott, you know, I, I'm big on the, uh, the three C's, man, but uh, you no know, communication, proper communication, collaboration with others, and then just cooperating with people. But as I get older in the supply chain field, I'm looking at caring, you know, the empathy and, uh, the loyalty to ensuring that everybody succeed on your team, man. It's like, you know, loyalty, like we look at it as loyalty to a person or whatever. I look at it as loyalty to an, uh, a bigger uh, field where everybody wins on your team, man. Like, it's not one guy win when you got a team. Everybody got to win. Uh, it's a win-win situation on a team. So I say caring, empathy, and then loyalty to the fact that your whole team needs to win. And they didn't know you care enough that they do win. You know what I'm saying? So... That's where I'm at with it now. I love that. Uh, and as I recall, there was a, and I cannot remember her name. Uh, I bet, I'm sure you can. There was a full bird colonel, I believe, that uh, you served under, and she was an inspiration to you. And uh, and she ended up uh, also, I believe, jumping out of planes too. Who, who was that person again, Charles? That was uh, Colonel Eugenia Sneed. 
She was yes. the Sars- she was the SARS-CoV G four. Matter of fact, every holiday, as a matter of fact, on the Thanksgiving, she'll send the whole team still uh, uh, a text message of, you know, she said, I go in battle with you guys right now today again. This was just recently. We talk on a regular basis and we just um, do buddy checks still to this day. Uh, she was an inspirational logistics uh, quartermaster leader. Uh, no fear at all. Um, able to to lead a logistic team of all males, you know. All of us were seniors in NCOs. I think the lowest ranking person on our team was an E7. Uh, and we had uh, uh, SOSCOM, Special Operations Support Command, had a logistic operational team that worked uh, to support the 112 Signal Battalion and then the 528 Support Battalion, and we supported all Special Operations Forces. So she was very, I followed her leadership for quite a while and learned from her uh, and watched how she dealt with pressure. See, because I like to look at leaders and see, when you put them in a pressure position, what decision do they make at that time? So I studied mm. that a lot. You know. So Colonel Sneed, if you're listening, uh, clearly you're an inspiration to Charles and and many of the folks that uh, that worked and served with you. Um, and Charles, that kind of takes it back to uh, at least what I heard there. Um, one of your biggest lessons learned was was uh, you know commitment to team, commitment to all team members, mm-hmm. winning and advancing, and opportunities for all. And it's and of course the value of uh, that buddy check you mentioned, which is common lingo in the military. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what an equivalent would be on the you know the private sector, the civilian side, but just making sure your colleagues are taken care of. You know, so many folks as the pandemic has taught us, Charles. I love to get your take here. So many folks. Um, suffer in silence or suffer by themselves alone and, and they're really isolated. I don't know about you, I saw that time and time again, even in some of the interviews we did, you know, so many remote interviews where you could tell folks had been by themselves for so long and it had impacted their mentality. But the value of that buddy check or, or you know, picking up the phone and mm-hmm. reaching out or dropping by and, right. and and seeing people and saying, hey, how you doing? Tell me, what you know, what's going on? And, and, and just... Uh, engaging with your your fellow colleagues, the value of that is immense, right? That's right, man. And and uh, it's got to be sincere, man. They gotta they gotta know you mean it. You know what I'm saying? Because people can feel, man. It's, you know, like you're saying, like my Angelo said, people might not forget how you treated them or what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes you can call somebody, and it be the right voice at the right time, the voice that they need to hear, and uplift them and say, hey, you know, it's gonna be okay because we're all going through something. You know, people right. might show an exterior of oh, we everything is fine, everything's fine, but and you gotta balance your family, you gotta balance your health, you gotta balance your finances, you gotta balance your job, and then you gotta keep everything in balance. And then you gotta balance your own mind, man, because I would call it the supercomputer, man, because when it was on your database, man, hey, you can change the software anytime, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> you just gotta look at it, you gotta look at it like, hey man, but I'm gonna share this with other people. Because there's no need for me to know something that's going to help somebody and keep it within. You know what I'm saying? It's not right. I don't, it don't make me feel right. So I just always check on people, you know. And you never know, man. You could save somebody's life, man. Because the military people, we we deal with things differently than a lot of people. We've seen a lot. We've experienced a lot. And when we see a lot of foolishness, external foolishness, we, we can't deal with that like that. We have to be in a controlled environment. Well, we got an objective and a mission, and we know our end state is in, in, in. We can see an end state, not just chaotic foolishness. We want to know. Right. You want me to do this? It's the process. I'm gonna follow your process, and you, my leader, you should have that process already mapped out, and I'm gonna follow you 100. Mm. percent That's where it is. All right, so uh, Charles, from our previous conversations, you're a big time reader, right? You're reading books all the time. You got a big love and passion for reading. What is um? What's one of your favorite recent reads maybe this year? The one recent read this year, I've been looking at the 48 Laws of Power. Uh, you know, Robert Greene, he breaks it down from the ancient times to now um, and how people can use power or misuse power. So power is a, is a it's, it's, it can create a man or a mouse, you know what I'm saying, because of the fact that there's so many ways you can use your power. Uh, we all have power. Uh, but it's just how you strategically use it to uplift people. And then if you uplift other people, you uplift yourself. You know, it's just, and I look at, I, li- I listen to Jim Rohn almost every day. And people that really live the life uh, that I want to live, so I study them. 
Uh, I got a library that a lot of people wouldn't even believe. But a lot of people that know me in the military know I was a reader. Uh, I always read. And I like to know uh, from my own standpoint how things work. So I listen to a lot of people. I like to study and show myself approved about it. So mm. it's different books I read. Uh, depending on my feelings and my mood, early morning, I'll go into it. And I try to share it on LinkedIn. That's mostly what I try to share with others uh, of how we can get, we can endure it through these challenges that we face. We just got to you know, stick together. You know? Yeah, I love that. And I see that all the time on LinkedIn. Folks, listeners, if you're not connected or following uh, Charles on LinkedIn, you're missing out. We're going to have a link to that um, in the episode uh, notes. Okay, so what I heard there, uh, I heard Jim Rohn, and that's R-O-H-N, right? That's, uh, yeah, that's yeah, one of the folks you listen to. Um, and then Robert Green is that the, the book you mentioned. What was the name of that title again? The 48 Laws of Power. The 48 Laws of Power? Yeah. Man, okay. Deep, All right. Man, it's really deep. <laughs> and then he breaks it down on the right on the right side of the book. He breaks down what what he's saying. It's like it, it's sort of like he's writing it in parables, uh, a story within a story. But you got to get the story within the story. It's just not face value. There's a message in there for you, and then how you make it applicable to your own life, and then how you see others doing the same thing that he's that he's expressing. So it's mm-hmm. a great book, man. And and most people that. The people that you meet on LinkedIn that are real smart people, I pay attention to a lot of them, strategically search them out. I, I know they know about that book. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to check it out. So, Robert Green, looks like you're doing some good work out there if you're listening. Um, okay. So, Charles, we've, we've really been talking leadership the whole conversation. I mean, it started with, uh, sounds like your your folks in Alabama and what the, how they raised you and, and the, the values they instilled in you to the time in the Army, uh, your time in the Army and who you served with and who you worked for with you know Colonel Sneed and the impact uh, all those folks, good folks had on you. And then, of course, now we're talking about, um, depending on who you talk to, we're either in a recession or heading into a recession, right? Um, and, and for a lot of folks, there's a lot of, uh, the uncertainty continues, right? We've been through the pandemic uh, globally, and uh, we all know the, the um, turmoil and, and um, the tragedy that that, uh, that inflicted on so many people. Of course, global supply chain had to find a way to do, do business much differently. And um, I think that's one of the silver linings of just how, out of sheer necessity, the innovation that, um, uh, that the pandemic fueled uh, across global business, really. Um, so let's talk about, in all, with all of that said, with uh, economic uncertainty and, and so much more as we move into to the new year, what are two or three leadership principles you believe are more relevant than, than, than uh, you know, during different times? Well, for me, everything you mentioned, Scott, is external to me. Everything, everything, you know, like I look at, I read about American history and, and the history of the different countries. Uh, they went through worse things than that. You know, pandemics, uh, recession, uh, depression. You know, if you look at depression, created more millionaires than than in people to realize uh, because those people didn't look at the external factor that was going on or the noise. Uh, people can predict anything. They can say, "Okay, uh, we have earthquake next year." Am I going to sit here and worry about an earthquake next year? No, I'm not that kind of person. So what I do, I focus on me and what I can, what I can control and what I can do. And then that relieves stress for me. You know, I don't sit there and think about, oh, uh, or they say, oh, wait, monkeypox is out. What's monkeypox? I don't know what monkeypox is. I don't want to know. So I don't, I don't entertain those things. I just, I just entertain the things in my mind that I pray about and I focus on those things and all the other noise just gets silenced for me. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, they focus on the news. They focus on what could happen. I focus on how I react to what happened. That's what so I the, power, the power of focus, the power of focusing on what's within your control seems to be a big, uh, a big part of your overall approach. Is that right? That's it. That's it. Um, clearly, from what you shared earlier, uh, the power of empathy and, and, and caring for others is a big part of your approach. If you're speaking to other leaders or um, folks coming up through the ranks, you know, um, recent graduates, you name it. What else would you, from a leadership, a practical leadership uh, perspective, what else would you add to your priority list right now? I would just say the main thing is trust and believe in yourself. You know, um, you know, we instinctively know what we want to do. 
uh, and we know what we can do. You know, stick with, grab, grab one or two things that you do very, very well, and you enjoy doing it. Um, you know, you might just want to be around a lot of people and uplift them or whatever. If you enjoy doing that and you would, and you would do it for free, stick with that. But that's really your passion. Uh, when you go out and try to step outside of who you really are, then you pretend to be somebody else and then you're not going to be happy. So what I do, I, I enjoy people. I enjoy expressing with people and sharing because of the fact that some of the things I learned in life might help some of these young people out here that's doing things that's crazy to me. But they don't, they don't have the foundation of a grew up like I did. Or they didn't have those leaders in the military that took out time with me and accepted me for who I am, right? So I have to go back and share that with other people, too. And that's what I do, man. I tell anybody, stick with what you would do for free. Mm. And that's your real passion. And that's where your money at. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's where right. your money at. Yeah. That's important for everybody, right? Everybody wants to be successful. Um, right. All right. Uh, two last questions here. And and uh, the first one's related to what we've been talking about um, in between supply chain management and leadership. Um, for folks that won't, what advice would you give um, folks thinking like um, students in college or maybe even high school and they're considering what career fields uh, to go into? You know, you and I both are, are very, um, we're, let's just Let's just put it plainly. We're big supply chain nerds, right? Big supply chain fans. Absolutely. Um, how, how would you um, advise students on why to enter the supply chain management field as a career? What would your answer to that be? It would be simple for me because of the fact that I would say, look at the problems that touch you. You know, like look at the world and like look at supply chain Look at Amazon. If you order something off Amazon, right, and it it didn't come as you saw it, or your friend said the same thing, you said, hey, you know what, Amazon it looks like this on the Internet, but it didn't show up like that, right? So you should be thinking, how can I fix that? Because, mm -hmm. you no, know, people pay you to fix problems, man. The world is full. Whenever you see a problem, that's an opportunity. That's a job for you, really, because uh, people that solve problems get paid. When people say, uh, how do you make more money than me? Well, he solved problems. He solved more problems than you, man. It's simple. <laughs> you don't solve no problems. <laughs> so, uh, and I just tell people that. Look for problems, then you find opportunities, period. And supply chain touches anything. You, you've got no shortage of problems either you're yes. reacting to, unfortunately, too often, but more and more, you're proactively avoid helping to uh, helping organizations and supply chains avoid. So uh, I love that. Uh, be a problem solver, make a difference, move the needle, and yes, uh, come join us in, in global supply chain trade and industry. Um, okay. So Charles, always a pleasure connecting with you. Uh, Charles Walker with the Gen, uh, no, the Gin Group, the Gin Group, a hard G. Yes, sir. Yes, um, sir. How can folks connect with you, Charles? Hey, they connect with me at uh, at C Walker at ginngroup.com. That's my email, my personal email, and also on LinkedIn. I don't know it by heart because LinkedIn is just an innate thing that I do. Um, it's, it's, it's more spirit-based for me. Um, when I feel something that I think uh, my followers uh, would benefit from, I post it, man. I don't have no certain time. I don't look at how many followers or none of that stuff. I just said, okay, I'm going to put that positive energy out there that I feel right now for me. And I, I think that my base of people that I follow as well will feel it um, and connect with it. So I don't, a lot of people say, well, thank you for 17,000 followers. Thank you for a million followers. I don't, I don't know how many followers there are uh, because uh, I just connect with the right people. So like you, and I connected, you and I connected, man, it was just, it, it was just, I, I feel like I create the people that show up in my life, man. Uh, if, if I, if a clown show up in my life, hey, I got to look at myself. You created the clown, man. So, uh, and, I, and I, I, I do it like that, man. That's just the way I am, man. Straight no, I, um, I can I can vouch for that, Charles. You and I have known each other for you know going back a few years now, and I'm a big believer and a big fan of your approach to LinkedIn. Um, you know, because it, it clearly is genuine. It comes from the heart. There's a ton of expertise. There's a there's a ton of give back based on what you've learned, and and perhaps one of my favorite parts. Is it's it's very inclusive and inspirational. So, folks, make sure you're connected with or following Charles Walker, and we'll make sure we have a link to that uh, in the episode notes. 
Okay. And make sure they follow your show, Scott, because you guys, you, you guys don't know the impact you have mm. on supply chain personnel, man. Uh, mm. I showed uh, a couple of videos here in my in my in my job here to these guys. They didn't they, did, they weren't familiar with it. I'm like, dude, there's a lot of good information here, man. That we, can, <laughs> you know, in the, in the supply chain business or or in government contracting, uh, you mm. guys touch, you touch on pain points for government uh, uh, agencies. And you actually you're giving a solution. If people look listen to you, you guys are, are looking at pain points, and when you relieve pain points, that's a contract, man. So there's so many ways to do it. But a lot of people, I use LinkedIn for the, the smart people out there because actually I hate I pay for all the degrees I got because LinkedIn is an actual degree. If you're you right. listen to it, you get the right people, and you connect with them. They'll share some information with you that you didn't get in the university that you paid for. So you got to look at LinkedIn as a tool of smart people that gather together and they are willing to share because they care enough about you and they are loyal to your success. So mm -hmm. that's what LinkedIn is to me. You know, I wonder if degrees are, are part of the next phase of the LinkedIn business plan. They might as well, they're doing everything else. You know, but to your point, uh, I bet they roll that out soon uh, and charge a pretty penny for it. We'll see, Charles. Uh, yeah. But hey, I always enjoy our time together. I really appreciate what you do and and the good and, and the positivity and the constructive uh, contributions you put out there in industry. So thanks so much, Charles Walker with the Gin Group. We'll make sure folks connect with you. And I appreciate you. You know, it's 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 it's, uh, it's heartfelt, man. I appreciate you. And remember that common sense is the new PhD. Okay. Hey, I like that. I like that. I, we've got lots of t-shirt isms every time we get with, with uh, Charles here. But hey, listeners, hopefully you've enjoyed this really frank um, and, and heart-driven conversation here with the one and only Charles Walker. But hey, it's all about deeds, not words. You got to act on this good advice you get. But regardless, uh, on behalf of our entire team here at Supply Chain Now, we wish you nothing but the best. Hey, do good. Give forward and be the change. Be like Charles Walker. And with that said, we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.